Well, it is seven o'clock on my screen, and uh, that means it's time to get rolling. So, greetings, everybody, and welcome to the last chapter happy hour of this fiscal year. I'm Will Clayton. As always, I'll be your host, and joining me tonight is Andrew Vabra. He is the Director of Marketing for Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever. Welcome. Glad to be here. And uh, the saying is, you know, save your best for last. That ain't the case here. So I don't know what you're doing lining me up last, man. No, just scraping the bottom of the barrel, but we'll get to that later. Uh -huh. um, as I mentioned, this will be the last chapter happy hour of this series, um, but we do intend to bring it back. So uh, between now and probably July or district meeting times, um, reach out to your regional rep. Let them know what topics are relevant to you, what you want to hear about, talk to your chapter about it. These are meant for chapter leaders. And I think we've pulled, pulled together 10 pretty relevant topics over the last eight or so months, um, finishing up with tonight. But we want to know more uh, from you. So that goes to your regional rep. Um, as always, these are recorded and they're going to be posted on the PF and QF chapter leaders YouTube page. Um, so if you want to go back and rewatch some of my other conversations, rewatch this one, if you remembered something um, or didn't write it down, they're going to be there for you. So you just go to YouTube, PFQF Chapter Leaders, subscribe there, and uh, we'll be putting all kinds of stuff up as the year progresses. And then lastly, before we jump into the conversation, use the Q&A function on the bottom. Um, that's the best way for Andrew and I to see the questions. The chat can get kind of messy. Q&A um, is easy for us to pick and choose which ones to uh, answer as long as they're relevant. If we don't get to your question, and I think there's probably going to be a few tonight, um, just send it to your regional rep and they will get it to me and I will either be able to answer it or I will find somebody who can. So now that we got that housekeeping out of the way, uh, and before we dive into engagement and recruitment, Andrew, I just want to get a little background. Um, Talk to the group about your path to Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever and what it means to be the director of marketing. Well, I'll save you, I'll save you the path to Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever because it's, it's fairly short. Um, at the ripe old age of 35 right now, I've already been with the org for 14 years. So I'm, I'm almost a lifer at this, at this point. Um, I started right uh, out of college as an intern in the, in the marketing and communications team as a PR intern, just uh, firing away press releases. From there, I migrated over to the membership team where I basically just did data entry because I refused to leave. Like once I got in the door at PF, I was like, uh-uh, I'm bigger than all of you people. You're going to have to throw me out the door. Like I'm not going anywhere. We'll find a way for me to stick around for something for me to do. Um, from data entry, I went to a warehouse. I was shrink wrapping prints, sending them out the chapters, fulfilling banquet packages. Like I was, I was the guy just wheeling and dealing with with UPS. And then finally, uh, Bob Saint Pierre was was kind enough to to find an opening back in the, in the Marcoms team for me to to rejoin. Um, and now I'm I'm the director of marketing. Uh, I primarily uh, was more involved in the membership side of things of marketing. Um, so I, I ran our national level membership and donation campaigns, uh, both through direct marketing, mailings, online, email, all of that. I did that for a long time, probably the better part of, of a decade. Um, now I help uh, oversee our graphic design team, our video production, our digital marketing, our website, and I also supervise like our web dev team. Um, so I have a very incredibly talented uh, roster of coworkers that I'm just absolutely blessed to be able to work with both in the field and uh, at the office or home office, if you will. And uh, chances are, um, you know, you've seen a lot of, of me and my team's work, whether you realize it or not. So the, the banquet package, the banquet book that's coming out soon for, for the upcoming year, that's, that, that's, on, that's on my team to help put that together. And I, I absolutely love it. Um, so it's been a long journey so far. I can't believe it's already been 14 years, um, but the place is sticky. We're all passionate about it. We love it. It's uh, it's part of who I am. Um, you know, I didn't have a gray beard when I started, and look at me now. So I'm I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. 
Yeah, um, man, I, I actually had no idea. I think just a couple of thoughts in that little intro. If anyone has ever met me or you, they realize they can't throw either of us out. Um, you know, so that's why I'm still here, clearly. <laughs> and uh, we could do a whole happy hour on your first 14 years, my friend. I had no idea you were shrink wrap and prints, working in membership and going through it all. I also am getting a little gray in my beard, so I'm not far behind you. But yeah, um, but you, you can do some of that just for men. I, I missed that wave. It's just my my, my my Czech roots are just taking hold. And the, the joke with me is I've done everything other than accounting because sure. I can't be trusted to use a calculator. And mm. that's that's very fair. Yeah, we're a lot alike in that regard. Um, so <laughs> engagement and recruitment. And I don't have a smooth transition off of what you did, but I, I, I really, I did sort of save this topic for the end, right? Well, obviously we're on the heels of Hands-On Habitat Day. Um, we've got a lot of chapters doing those events, uh, either earlier in the month, last weekend, and some are even postponed. And we'll get to that a little bit later, but I want to start the conversation just sort of setting the stage. I've been a regional rep um, here, here in Minnesota, but just in general for six years. And the number one question I get asked outside of, you know, what's my username and password is how do we attract new and specifically younger volunteers? I, I don't know that of the 37 chapters I'm fortunate enough to serve that any one of them hasn't in some way asked that question. I think it's absolutely critical that we do um, actively pursue newer, younger, more diverse volunteers. And we'll touch on some of those strategies at a chapter level as we move through this conversation. But you do engagement and recruitment as well at a national level. I mean, we're trying to engage the same demographic, just bring them in underneath our umbrella of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. So I, I want to start there. And if we can just have a quick conversation at an organizational level, give our listeners a little snapshot of like what we look like now and where we're off to. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we can, you know, in order to dive into the need of diversifying and engaging with new audiences, you probably have to have a pretty clear understanding of who you are to begin with and, and why that's, that's important. Um, you know, it, it's often said throughout Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever that we have, like have two extremely strong assets, and that's our good name and our volunteer base. Um, our chapter leadership and our volunteers are at the core of who we are. And so we know we have you know, 600 Pheasants Forever chapters across the country, 100 Quail Forever chapters across the country. But who actually, who are these people? Like, who are the people that are are you know carrying the torch forward right now and what does our membership base look like so i figured i'd kind of take people out like give them a quick snapshot of like pfqf as it stands at, at, a, at a very high level and thankfully due to surveys and other online like insights and tools we we have a pretty good idea um so not to get too deep into like marketing jargon or, or lingo we have four main like personas or types of supporters um, that we that we have at our at our core, if you will. And yes, we've named them. Um, so just to run people through like who we think we're speaking to or who we know we're speaking to, you have Jay or Jane. They're the conservation minded hunter. Like they're they're the center of the bullseye of, of our or our of our audience. Then you have Steve or Susan. Um, they're the hardcore obsessed upland hunter slash bird dog nut. We all know that person. Uh, then you have Tim or Tammy. They're the, the current landowner or the habitat manager, or maybe they're like the habitat centric chapter volunteer. They're the guys that get absolutely jacked about, you know, con you know controlled burns and, and, you know, planting grass. Like they're the habitat nuts. And then you have Adam Moran. They're like the multi-species generalists that want to do it, do it all. They probably don't do all of it very well, but they're super engaged and, and they get it. So those are kind of like our, our four main audiences. And uh, before I let people think that we just make up names and move on, I figured I'd actually read through one of like the, the psychographics for one of these people. Just like I, I find it entertaining and you invited me, so I'm taking over. How about that? Um, I'll, I'll just do Jay, right? Yeah. So Jay is a conservation-minded hunter. 
The conservation-minded hunter has rural roots and understands the connection between healthy lands and abundant wildlife. No longer motivated by full game bags, this person wants to feel like they are a positive influence on the property they hunt while also being a part of a larger conservation movement. They display their Pheasants Forever decal with pride. They're most likely male, between the ages of 50 and 65, live in the suburbs, have a college degree, above average income, they're a habitat and conservation advocate, they have family in rural settings, they're primarily a private land hunter, but they do hunt public lands, and they're primarily a chapter banquet attendee, and they buy merchandise. So, like, that's just the top level of, of J. You know, we get down to, like, what hope spheres realities. They're hoping for more opportunities and chances to be a field. They fear society's diminished interest in hunting, as well as shrinking access and bird numbers. And the reality is that he doesn't get out as much as he used to, but he values these moments even more. So that's how, like, that's just like the tip of the iceberg. Like, that's how specific we are about talking to people in a way that we know will, will resonate with them. At a higher level, in terms of just like the org snap, like snapshot, we're 94% male. 66% are over the age of 55. 12% live in an urban setting. 31 live in the suburbs. And 57% are rural. So I'm going to let like, that section sink in just for a second, and I'm guessing our audience can pick up on what I'm going to harp on next. 94% male, nearly 70% are over the age of 55. So that gets the, the now that there's your segue, Will. There, there's, there's what we're getting at when it comes to like the, the importance of increase in engagement and recruiting efforts, because we're not getting any younger. Right. I know I'm not. Look at my beard. Yeah, we right. We touched on that from the beginning, man. Um, incredible. One, uh, for those listening at home, never have we ever used the term sociographics on a chapter happy hour. So we're 12 minutes into this thing and I'm learning as we go along. That was, I didn't know that it was, it was drilled down to that level, right? Like that, the amount of research and understanding that you and your team and this organization has on who we are is incredible. But all that does to your point is it solves for the equation of, well, we need to, we need to bring that next group in. Right. And obviously you've made the case for why it's important to bringing in new volunteers, diversifying our base. Um, and obviously our chapter network needs those individuals too. New folks bring new ideas on into the future, right? What is Pheasants Forever looking like into the future? So what are the strategies you're using now that you understand who we are as, at, your, at your level, at your team, you understand who we are, what do you use to, to try to attract that younger demographic? I'm 31. There's a few of me in our chapter networks, specifically the ones that I serve. There's plenty of young individuals that are attending banquets, certainly, but, you know, are they entering into our organization? Are they, you know, how do we create a name for that next generation? What's the strategies you're employing now? Well, it's, it's definitely strategies for, for sure, um, because it, it's more than just age, too. Now, we have an incredibly strong base right now. But, but how do we continue to solidify our foundation of supporters and our chapter leaders and all the efforts they're doing now while expanding our, our sphere of influence? And it does go beyond age. Um, we, we know younger people bring more energy in larger social circles. And they're, all like, and they're also the future, right? They're the next, they're the next generation up. We, we need them. There's also gender. You know, women are the fastest growing segment in, in the hunting community. And that needs to be a representative within our own ranks. And we also just need to be have more overall diversity and inclusion at large. There's yeah. so many other communities out there that are passionate about clean water, healthy habitat. These are things that resonate with everybody. They just don't know who we are and the impact we have. Or maybe they haven't experienced the beauty in our upland landscapes and, and like the pleasure of following a good bird dog. So there's strategies because just as we can get dialed in with our, our core personas that we talk to, well, who are, who are what I consider the next outer ring of people? You know, they, they might not be the core right now, but in 10 years, they might slide closer to that center. So it's important that we're engaging with them now to set the stage and get them interested 
now so that in 10 years, you know, when, when the current chapter president is just like, I've, I've had my run. I did my, I did my best. I'm so proud of what I've done. Who do I pass the baton to? We, mm-hmm. we can't have that happen. Like our chapters and our volunteers, I mean, it's the core of who we are. Like, so we need to reinvest in that. We need to invest in ourselves is basically what we're doing. And so these different supporters and these different people that we want to speak to, they all have different trigger points. They all have different interests. But all of them, if we were to make the Venn diagram, can intersect at our mission. Uh, you, you like that? I didn't I want do. to be the hard. Yeah. But, yeah. No, nope. hand motions are good. <laughs> so we can't be gatekeepers. Like we have to be opening gateways for people. Yeah. And in order to do that, you have to find the avenues in which they want to walk. Um, so like habitat, dogs, pint nights, like what what are people's specific trigger points and how can we speak to them and where are they to actually find them? So I brought up my direct marketing background. Now I'm I'm casting a net to 500,000 people, like, right? And the goal is to catch as many as I can, have them learn about our organization, sign up to become a member, and then funnel them through our ranks and have them land at a chapter banquet. Like that's that's the overall goal. Same with social media. It's creating compelling and and engaging content that brings year round relevance so that when we do make an ask or when we do have an event like locally, they're like, oh yeah, I wanna do that. You need year round relevance and you need to be speaking in, in ways and language that resonates with them. Not everybody is gonna wanna go participate in a, in a prescribed burn. Not, not everybody is gonna wanna go pick up trash. Some folks might. Some people would love to like snap some photos and get themselves on Instagram and, and feel really good about making a difference. It's important. It's mission centric. Maybe someone's intimidated by guns but wants to hunt. How do they do that? Or maybe someone's just really interested in dogs. Dogs are the ultimate gate gateway. It's like I'm, we're hosting a dog centric event. Mm-hmm. That's a good way to reach reach a lot of people. Um, like for me personally, like I I didn't start off knowing a lot about big blue stem or pine savannas or the importance of, you know, milkweed for, for, mon- for monarchs. I, I sure as heck love my yellow lab. <laughs> and so it's just like, Oh, wait a second. My dog finds birds in good habitat. Maybe I should care about good habitat too. So my dog was my gateway to the habitat organization to caring about our mission and for it to like resonate within me. Everybody has a different trigger. It could even be food. Yeah. Hosting a wild game event. Like having that connection from the land to the plate to you and how it all works in terms of like a healthy landscape produced this healthy meal that I feel really good about that I went and worked for that I get to share with family and friends. That's incredibly powerful. That's also inspiring. It also makes you want to do more. Like like what are these various trigger points? Like even our own chapter leaders, like what got them involved? I bet it wasn't hosting a banquet. I bet if every chapter volunteer watching this, it's like, what was my motivation for getting, like being involved in Pheasants Forever? It was not to spend countless hours planning and conducting a banquet. Mm -mm. The banquet was an an ends to a mean in terms of taking care of mission. Because why do we care about the mission? Because the end result, we care about healthy landscapes, clean water, more abundant wild birds. Like, it's important to take it like take a step back and really think about why do I care? What was my point of entry? What like what made me step up to the plate? Because sometimes we get stuck in our own little bubble and our own little kind of niche, and we forget about what it was like when you were a twenty something, kind of intimidated. Like there, a, a twenty year old isn't going to walk into a VFW and uh, the door creaks behind him, and then a, a table of ten guys just turn and stare. That's right. That, that's probably not like the best introduction nor the most compelling reason for that 20 year old to want to stick around. But you invite them out to like a hands on habitat event or they find out about it and they just show up. That's a pretty like non judgmental, easy entry, non awkward. Like you don't have to sit there and carry on like a fake conversation if you don't want uh-huh. to. You just kind of get to know each other. And by the end of the day, you're probably cracking a beer, cracking jokes, having a good time. You're like, man, that was great. I felt like I did something. 
as large or as little as the project you tried to accomplish was. I feel like I did something. Yeah. I feel good. I want to do more of that. Your ch- this is what your chapter does. Oh, you guys are having a banquet later on. Yeah, I'll co- I'd, I'd love to attend. I'd, I'd love to support a group that I see doing work in my own backyard. Mm-hmm. Same thing with engagement events, whether it's like youth pollinator events or learn to hunt events or mentorship events or bird dog days, things like that. It's showing up and hey, these guys are pretty fun. And like what they're doing is making a difference for something I care about or something I'm learning to care about. Like I can go on and on, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, you're, you're doing it. Like I, this is it. Like, you, you talked about a lot. Of, you talked about a lot there and we'll, we'll unpack some of that. But what I think, you know, there's a lot of great points that you made, but you know, you're, you're the director of marketing for Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. You're trying to bring folks into the fold of an organization you're finding their trigger points, guiding them to a local event, hoping that they'll join a local chapter and continue to build our base because our mission is delivered through our chapters. So you're doing that with a, a really talented team, as you alluded to earlier. But I think towards the end of, of you know, sort of that, that conversation, I picked up on, you know, these are things that chapters can do as well. Chapters don't need a marketing department, but they can certainly make things, make a meaningful or put on a meaningful event to engage or trigger, trip someone's trigger, let's throw it that way, to then bring them into the banquet, a more inviting scenario. You talked about being relevant year round, right? You're, that's, that's kind of what I want to get to uh, later on. But, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. And I've had the good fortune to start, restart chapters all across Minnesota and talk to a ton of chapter volunteers. I've, I've been to you know, likely 100 meetings, you know, and, and events all across this place. And I, I truly think that people, if they're going to volunteer their time, you, you have to do something that like moves you emotionally. Like it has to, it has to feel good to do it. Or it's got to be really fun. I mean, why else would you give generously of your time to give back to something, right? There's a Minnesota Timberwolves playoff game going on right now. They haven't been in the playoffs since I was like 12 years old. But I'm here, and I'm, I'm okay with that because this place is really fun to work. It's really fun to engage with these chapter volunteers and see the work that they do. But the mission moves me emotionally, which is why it's fun sitting here talking to you and sharing our thoughts on engagement and recruitment with our chapter leaders. And I loved your, I loved your little analogy about the 20 year old walking in to a, a meeting. And cause I've seen that scenario play out. And I think if all the chapter leaders that are listening now and that are going to watch this later, if they really fought back, they can probably think of a scenario like that too. I mean, if we want to engage and recruit, we also need to be open-minded and honest with ourselves as a chapter volunteer. We need to make these chapters inviting. Just last week, I joined well, in Minneapolis. It's the uh, Lake Country Retrievers Club. For those of you that were with me on the very first chapter happy hour, you'll remember my camera cut out midway through because my little puppy pulled the cord out. He's now in his kennel and has been for every other chapter happy hour since. That's beside the point. He's getting to be a, a, a pretty good dog. We're, we're training a ton, but to take the next step, I, I wanted to join a club. I wanted to learn how to train these dogs, right? And so I showed up on Tuesday and look, I'm on a mic in front of hundreds of people, usually once a week. I'm going to chapter meetings. I'm having difficult conversations. We're raising money. Like I don't get the, the butterflies in the stomach much anymore, but driving up to that field and seeing all those people there was nerve wracking to me, but I'm 31. I'm a bit, I'm a, I'm a big guy. And I walked right in there and got to know them. But what blew me away was, was I willing to do that? Yes. But also they ran one drill. There had to have been 40 people lined up to run this drill with the chapter president. And they had a trainer there all with their dogs, all on a line. They're all laughing and sharing stories. It felt like a pheasants forever chapter. Like it felt like that community. And I was a part of that community in an inviting way. And I was like, 
well, why, why can't we do this? Why are they so successful? I, I got to talking with the chapter president who I actually met at the state fair booth. I worked for Pheasants Forever back in uh, August. And he said they've got 30 new members in the last three weeks. They're 160 strong. The club is just exploding. And you alluded to it. I mean, bird dogs, that's it. I mean, that was your trigger to the organization. There's a specific um, name uh, that is a bird dog diehard in here. I mean, this is our this is our core, and you know, it just it 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 moves me to think about a different ways that chapters can operate, and that's kind of where I want to go to next is how do we attract people into our chapters? You touched on a lot of things at a high level, but Taking my little anecdote about the Lake Country Retrievers Club, this is a club that specifically focuses on dog training, field trials, that sort of thing. But we can do that too. And we can move our mission, our habitat mission into a chapter. And I think you can even strengthen that, amount, that, that group of folks that's there. And so I do wanna to touch on you know, that, like what is, what do we need to do more specifically to be relevant and attract new folks? And certainly younger, more diverse, gender, certain women, but just in general, there were folks there from all age ranges, right? They're fired up to be a part of something. And I felt like it was something that we could do as a ch at a chapter level and then move them more into habitat. So let's talk a little bit about that's those strategies. What are some things that chapters can take away from tonight that they can try to get more people involved? I think first that you have to be willing to take a risk. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get, we'll, we'll probably touch on the, the hands on habitat stuff later, but you, just, you have to be able to take a risk. But while you're doing so, do it on a, do it involving an event or a new alternative event that you're actually interested in, that you want to go do, so that it's, it's fun for you. You hit on that. You know, you brought up the, the bird dog stuff again. Your interest in dogs was strong enough and compelling enough to get you over the intimidation of going and meeting new people. That's the same reaction that the general public has about perhaps getting involved with the chapter. There's some intimidation there, even just attending a, a, a banquet if you don't know a lot of people. Or you don't have that one gregarious friend who's like, we're going to this. Let's go. Like, the interest has to be compelling enough for them to take that, that risk. Um, and I'll, just before we get into it, like, I will say our chapters are already doing this. Now, for bird, for bird dog days specifically, we have a great relationship with NAVDA. So we have chapters all over the country who are actually partnering with their local NAVDA chapter. And they're, host, they're hosting these bird dog days. And they can be as... Something as simple as like an informal kind of seminar with a local kennel to learn more about breeds or learn more about basic commands, break it down between pointers or flushers. Just get people out there who are interested in maybe picking up a puppy or maybe they just got a dog and they didn't realize they had a bird dog, but they're like, this thing isn't happy unless it's running and it's always pointing butterflies and pigeons in the park. Like it makes my, it makes my dog happy to do this. I just want to see what it's all about. Like that's a, that's a first step because nobody's just going to walk up to a chapter unless they're super passionate. And I know these people do exist, so yeah. I, you can't make blanket statements, but nobody's yeah. just going to walk in and say, sign me up for habitat chair. <laughs> sign me up for, for chapter banquet chair. You know, it, it's not what happens. It's almost like a new relationship. You're, you're not just going to be like, hi, we just met. I'm, I'm signing up for life. Mm until death do us part. It's like, no, you, you date a little bit, you feel each other right. out. So like, what's a first fun date? It, it, it's a compelling event that the chapter's gonna have fun putting on because it resonates with them, they want to do it. And they're gonna take a risk and just invite people in their own backyard through their own channels. They can use the tools that Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever actually have to get that word out there. Because I guarantee they will find people in their own backyard they didn't know were there that actually care because it's like, well, my daughter is, always has a volleyball, you know, tournament over, over your banquet. Or, you know, actually, like, I, I've been away at college. I didn't even know you guys had anything. But 
my weekends are busy with my boys and I just haven't gotten around to it. Like, well, what's another way at a different point of the year that we can still reach out to these people that are in their backyard that care. They might not know they care a lot yet, but they will once they see something come across. It's like, that's really interesting. Oh, they're, they're going and improving the, the local stream, the riparian habitat down, down the road. I know where that is. Yeah, why not? I, I can go, I can go help them, see what happens. A couple of conversations spark, they end up at the banquet, they attend another event, and before you know it, you have a young guy or gal who's like, yeah, I'll help you guys at the banquet. I can greet people at the door, I can take tickets. And then another year goes by and it's like, yeah, I wanna be on the committee. Like that's how this kind of progresses and we're, we're seeing it happen across the country. It's nothing new, mm-hmm. it's just like, it needs a bit more new energy and new areas. And I think more people need to open up their eyes that we're not banquets forever. Right. Banquets are a big part of our fundraising model, 100%. Like they're, they're crucial to our mission, but it's not like do a banquet and walk away. Like there's a lot of different ways to reach new people and have a, a significant impact in your local community that honestly can be more fun and less stressful than hosting a banquet. That's a lot of work. And I recognize that. So it's like, you got to have fun with these guys too. It can't be like a second job. Nobody wants a second job. I don't. <laughs> so it's it's a you just have to kind of reframe your brain and be willing to take a risk in an area that interests you. So we already have materials that exist that, that help chapters think about planning hands-on habitat events, bird dog days, learn to hunt or or shoot or mentorship events. We have an entire women on the wing like program. Pint nights are bubbling up all over. You know we have invitation templates that exist in ticketprinting.com. You know, Event Groove can send emails automatically from that to people on your list. Like we have the beginning of a, a good set of tools for chapters to use. It's not perfect. We need more and I need to learn what else is actually beneficial for chapter leaders. But it's there and we know some chapters are using it successfully. And it's just so darn like contagious. It's, yeah. it's a lot easier to like kind of, poke your head over the fence and be like, wow, those guys are crushing it. That looks like a lot of fun. Maybe we should do that. Like to actually like see someone doing it versus having me be a blowhard and be like, you guys need to get up there and do more all year. Like it's, I get it. Trust me guys. I get it. But I'm telling you that these events are taking place. This engagement is happening and they're having so much fun with it that it's, it's contagious. And that's why, we just did the hands-on habitat thing. It's like, well, we want to do that too. Like, let's let's lead by example in terms of like capture some of the same energy we're seeing out in the field and like, let's host something ourselves. Like, and it's so much fun. And people yeah. are always asking, when's, when's the next one? Right. It's like, I don't know. Give me a second. <laughs> uh, exactly. And you got, um, without even me guiding you, of course, you got to where I wanted to, to get to. and. You know, I do want to, I, we've got some more things I want to unpack, but I, I want to just stop real quick. So Andrew talked through some of the tools we have available and the idea of, you know, taking a risk. Well, you can take, certainly take the risk and do something different, right? Host an event or a couple of events where you're reaching out to your membership. You're reaching out to your supporters. You have a regional rep that's there to serve you. So if, if you need help, that is your go-to contact. But we've got resources built, and I just threw four of them in, in the chat. And I'm not sure if you're all able to download out of the chat, but we can send these to you. But we've got really well put together guides on how to host a Clays for Conservation event, how to put on a pint night, how to host one of these bird dog days that Andrew was talking about. And lastly, how to host a, a hands-on habitat day, right? We've got planning guides for each and every one of these pre-built, take them, use them, go through them. Once you do one, you'll probably never look at the guide again. And, and most of you know how to put on an event, but the idea is what Andrew said. We're not banquets forever. We're not meetings forever. We need to be working in our communities, engaging with these folks at a fun but meaningful level. Those guides are there to help you. 
the tools we have available as far as marketing from a direct chapter have never been easier. Uh, you know, we're alluding to this hands-on Habitat Day, and I had a, a probably a, a half dozen or more go off last weekend, and almost every one used Event Center to send an email to their membership, and it takes five minutes. Every time I did that, I was on the phone with the chapter president. We walked through how to do it, and they said, wow, that was really easy. I mean, it pre-generates an email for you. All you need is your membership list, which you can get from the chapter resource portal or your regional rep can get. You copy the emails out of there, paste them in, send it off. And, and I attended two different hands-on Habitat events uh, and found folks that were drawn through that email to that event. So the, we're trying to make it as easy as possible because you know, marketing through the mail or doing your local newspaper, certainly that's, there's value there. But sending that email, using social media, you know, that's how we're attracting folks now. And before we kind of move on and, and, you know, Andrew sort of mentioned, we need more, right? And we'll get to that. But I, I do want to reset the scene a little bit because it's asking, you kind of touched on it about being a blowhard saying to do more. And that's not the mindset that I want the chapter leaders listening at home and the ones that are going to watch to think about. It's my job to serve you guys, right? And it's your regional rep, whomever it may be, it's, it's our job to serve. And folks that are volunteering their time to further the mission of our organization, a lot of what we're talking about is adding events to your calendar. And that obviously seems daunting. But what I want you to think about is the concept of taking a meeting off. And I want you to carry that through your next year and the next year. When these come up, you say, hey, I jumped on chapter happy hour with Andrew and Will. This is what they were talking about. How many meetings are relevant? How much time has been spent arguing about champagne chicken or roast beef for that banquet? Because I've been in a lot of meetings and those conversations can go on for a long time. And I know you're out there. Pick a meal. They're not going to remember. It's all going to taste good. Take that meeting off and try one of these events. And if it goes well, if you get one or two folks, that's a win. I mean, chapter committees are eight, 10, 12, maybe 15 people. If you add one, two, three in the next one, two, or three years, you've got a brand new committee. Take the risk, take a meeting off, and go out and have fun. That's what I'm trying to say. We're not adding things to an already overburdened chapter. We understand that. I certainly do. But We've got the tools and resources available to make this easy. Consider just skip the meeting, skip the business, go shoot clay pigeons, even if it's with your chapter. Just go back out there after what we've been through the last 18 months and have fun again. That's what I'd love everybody to walk away from. But I do want to ask a question of the folks. We've got a couple of questions in the Q&A, so we'll touch on those right now. But I do want to acknowledge that like, we're not perfect, right? We've got a lot going on. Um, you know, we've, we're building tools and toolkits and guides, but what are the limiting factors that you see in your local chapter? So now I'm not speaking so much to Andrew, I'm speaking to the folks that are listening. What are the limiting factors that you're seeing in your communities to attracting new people? And, and you can be honest, you know, what are your current fears? What are your hesitations? What are your concerns? Throw them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, and then if you've got an idea on, you know, how can we make these events more approachable? What's, what more can we do to make it easier to engage and recruit new volunteers? If you can just add some information in the chat, throw it in the Q&A, certainly I would appreciate that right now. Um, you know, it's Andrew and I and his team, we're the ones that are creating a lot of this stuff. And uh, these are just the first four that we thought of. And some of them are working, and it's working all across the country, as Andrew alluded to. But I, I'd love to, I'd love to hear, hear some more there. Andrew, I think we've got a couple of questions here. One's pretty relevant. Uh, you are fortunate enough to impact areas where there are native birds. So help me understand how we recruit volunteers in areas that we do not have any native or risk-placed birds. So. 
I'll, I'll start and I'll see if you have any thoughts there. Um, I've got, our mission is interchangeable. It, it can kind of work anywhere. I've got a really, really successful Pheasants Forever chapter in Duluth, Minnesota. There probably isn't a live pheasant within a hundred miles of that place, but they're active in their community. All summer they're doing events. They're, they, they host a lot of, you know, adult learn to hunt. They're working a lot with the kids in their community and it's, it's completely transformed their chapter, right? It just plays into what we're talking about. This mission can work anywhere. And certainly it works where we've got core pheasant quail populations, but that's my experience. Andrew, is there anything you want to build off on? You know, how are, how are chapters out east successful? You know, uh, how are chapters successful where you don't have a native population of our favorite upland game birds? Yeah, I guess in general, the, the question was asked by, by Tom Kelsey. I'm curious to know where, where he's coming from just for, for the sake of knowing that. Um, but the, the beauty in who we are and our unique grassroots model and the fact that you out there, the chapter leaders, get to choose how you want to make an impact in your own backyard means you're relevant no matter where you are. We have chapters in, in Michigan's UP. We have chapters in Washington State. We have chapters in lots of areas that probably will never have like a wild pheasant, for example, but I guarantee there's other wildlife around. Like we're the habitat organization. Oh. We get things done for on the landscape. The upland landscapes can be completely varied depending on what geography and what region you're in. It all matters. Clean water matters. Healthy habitat, healthy soil matters. That's at the core of our mission. Now, sometimes we do get a little a little stuck on, on, on the bird on the hat, right? We do so much more than that. We have, we, we as an organization have some of the most meaningful impact on monarch butterflies than anybody else in the country. A lot of people don't recognize that. A lot of people don't know that. And maybe that's my fault as the marketing guy for not, <laughs> not making that a bigger deal. But like the, we, have, we, have, we have chapters in helping out with mule deer, with sage grouse. There's so many native prairie birds in general that really like resonate with our audience. But you name the landscape and there's probably something that can be done. And if that's what's relevant to people in your neck of the woods, go for it. That's the power of our unique model. That's, that's why we have people that are flipping from other orgs to us, even if there's a pheasant within 300 miles. Because it's like, well, we just want to make a difference here. Like we want to see like the actual impact that our banquet has, that our own community can have when they rally together. And that's what we want to empower. Like that's that's some of the contagious energy that we're referring to this hands-on habitat uh, event that we keep on harping on, but we just did it last weekend. So it's, it's, it's top of mind. Right. Um, it just creates this infectious energy and it's not because, Oh, there was a pheasant right there for some chapters are lucky enough that, yeah, there probably were quite a few and they heard them, but for other people, it's just making a difference and knowing that you're having an impact on the landscape, or maybe it's just having an impact on, on youth in your city and get making them expand their horizons figuratively, figuratively and literally to be like, you know what, these outdoor spaces, they, they do matter. I might not have ever explored beyond my local county park, but you know, that beautiful grassland out, out in the you know, middle of South Dakota or Kansas, that matters too. And that, and here's why, you know, that, that has to start somewhere. So don't get hung up on the bird. Like right. the power is in our model and the fact that we're the habitat organization. So you can always lead with that because it resonates with anybody. Yeah, uh, well said. And I, I think that's a, that's a beautiful transition. We should, we've been talking about it. Let's talk hands-on Habitat Day really quick. And, and I think to your point, you know, if you're in Wyoming, well, let's see, I'll, 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 I'll reset. On Saturday in a thunderstorm, I went out to a new WMA with a chapter who hosted one of these events. And uh, there was 30, 35 people there. It was packed. And as soon as the rain stopped, we all jumped out. And like you said, it, it was like an infectious atmosphere and we hadn't even accomplished anything yet. We ended up pulling a couple of miles of old and rotten fence, all the fence posts, picking up you know, trash and things that our dogs can get tripped up on. That was in you know, Minnesota, just outside the Twin Cities. But to your point and to the, the original question, there's no reason that can't happen in Wyoming. 
where you're primarily a bunch of you know mule deer hunters or big game hunters, right? It was partnering with a local, um, in this case, it was the Minnesota Department of Natural Resource Sources. You know, they had a project for us. We went out and did it, and we hauled a lot of stuff out of there. And it was meant. This whole concept was meant to sort of kick off these, like to make it okay to take a risk and to do something different. Not only have we kind of been inside for a couple of years and it felt like the right time to go out again and accomplish something, but, you know, we're kind of, we're talking about changing a, a culture here. You know, I started this thing with the, you know, the number one question I get asked, right? How do we, in, how do we engage and recruit newer, younger, different individuals and bring them into our chapter? In, in order to do that in our, in our mind is to take a risk, make it fun, make it meaningful, make it emotionally relevant for somebody to come and join your chapter and then bring them in little by little, right? Hands-on Habitat Day to me was our first ever sort of at scale engagement and recruitment weekend or engagement and recruitment, you know, endeavor. It, it was meant to kickstart this changing of the, of the culture. This question has been asked to regional reps likely before me, probably since the inception of this organization. We wanted to make it okay to go and do this. And there's safety in numbers, right? So we had, I don't know, 70 to 80 chapters pull off an event. Your team did a phenomenal job on social media through email marketing, building out those templates to make it okay to do this. And there's an adoption curve to everything. And I, I think we're at the very beginning of the adoption curve. It's very timely that we did that. And then we're having this conversation. But that was sort of the, the thought behind the hands-on Habitat Day concept. I don't know if you had any takeaways you wanted to share with the group uh, or those that are going to listen at home. But, I, you know, I really enjoyed the two events that I attended in every, in both scenarios, I made a point to talk to the, the folks I hadn't, I didn't know before, right? To the best of my ability. Every time they said, you know, I hadn't been to a local banquet. I've been a member on and off, but this is what I like to do. And the, a lot of times they, in both instances, they brought fa their families out, right? The wives and kids, and we're picking up brush and we're pulling fence. Like, this is what I like to do. And if that doesn't sound like a, a, a trigger point, I don't know what is. But that was the, the sort of the thought behind that endeavor. I don't know if you had any other thoughts that you wanted to share with the group or if you had any highlights um, that you that come to mind. Yeah, I mean, it kind of started as supposed to be a little like almost a pilot event in terms of let's see if we can get a few chapters to buy into this idea to take a meeting off, try something different and see how the local community reacts to it. See what kind of you know, foothold we can get in and, and what else that sparks. Like, is this something we should be putting more energy into? And suddenly it kind of exploded to this. Well, let's make it a nationwide initiative and see how many chapters we can get on board right away. And it was, it was amazing to see 70 plus different chapters step up to the plate in a very short amount of time. Be like, yeah, we'll, we'll try it. We'll go for it. Um, and for me personally, the seeing it all work from behind the scenes in terms of just taking it in as, as a general attendee, so the chapter whose event I went and participated with, I'm not a regular member of. None of those guys knew who I was. I didn't know any of them. There are close to 30 people there. I think only like five of us knew each other. And so again, it's okay, I'm, I'm gonna go try this. There might be a little intimidation, but once you get there, it's like, oh, this is kind of fun. All these guys have this, you know, these people have the same interest as me. This is pretty neat. And so to kick it off, I got two emails from the chapter through event group leading up to the event that kind of just kind of said, reminder, here's the event, here are the details, show up, have fun. That's all you need to do. Like no money involved. Just show up and bring a good attitude, a pair of gloves, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so then I attended the event, had a fantastic time. A day later, I got a thank you note from them automatically. I got this, like, I might be a marketing, but I didn't do any of this. This is just happening to me as a user. And then two days later, I got an invite to their banquet. And it's just like, yeah. Yeah. I just met all these guys. I just, <laughs> I just hauled brush with, I recognize that name. I'd love to go support them. Like, 
that's kind of like the energy that we're talking about here in terms of it can get people into the door and it can also get them involved in the chapter in a fun way. Mm-hmm. And like, that's, it's so great to be able to impact mission, meet new people, have fun, and then realize, man, we're kind of inadvertently bolstering our ranks and getting people through the door at our banquet all at the same time. Cause it's not just a banquet attendee. There's nothing wrong with being just a banquet attendee. Yeah. But these are engaged people. Now they feel like they're helping. They feel like that they can do more like, an engaged participant versus just a banquet attendee, what would you, what would you rather have? Well, this is a great tool to create like a whole different level of engagement and loyalty and buy-in. Like these are the sticky people that you could lean on in the future. Um, and that's what we're kind of hoping takes place. And we learned a few things. I think we'll probably tool this, you know, national day of, of habitat a little differently next year and maybe avoid Turkey season for a lot of us. Yeah. Um, whoops. But yeah. uh, no, it was, it was a great first step, and we took a risk. Yeah, you no, know, we're we're trying what we're preaching. Like we just we just kind of went for it and wanted to see what would happen. Like, what's the worst? It's like, oh, you ended up in out there with your normal chapter guys, and you still did a project which is relevant and great anyway. Like, there, there's really there wasn't a lot of risk. No, not a lot of risk at all. Ton of reward, and I'm I'm overjoyed that you had the sort of the same experience I did, and I love the. Uh, that's a sneaky chapter leader there, right? You know, I mean, they bring you in, you have a good time at the hands-on habitat day, they send you a thank you, which is automated, I'm sure, or took about five minutes to send through a vent center. Your rep can help you with that. And then two days later, you get an invite to the banquet. That's, that's textbook. I mean, that feels like it should be the, the, the process moving forward. I hope that resonates with some of the folks listening uh, at home. We've got just a couple of questions, but we're, we're bumping up to eight o'clock, which I expected. I figured we could probably talk about this for the better part of a day, but this is a chapter happy hour nonetheless. So um, I'm going to see if there's anything here. Randy, when you create an event, what are the recommended ways to promote it ahead of time? Um, you know, we've got the director of marketing here, but I, I don't know. I, I, um, I always send the automated email. Um, it's, it doesn't feel botty or like, you can put whatever you want in the message. You can create your own message, but it, it just gener- it generates um, an email with the description you put in your event in the event center and the information on how to participate. I do that. And then we have social media templates that are available on ticket printing. Um, we've yeah, got- templates, templates exist for all of the events already that we've, we've yeah. rattled off here. Um, so that's a really good point. And you know, the, the automated emails, it's such an easy lift. Um, like one thing I really like to insert and stuff like that is please share with a friend or ask your own friend groups to like share this with other like-minded people. Cause right. we all, we have our circle, but then they probably have their own fringe circle. Like mm-hmm. the power of being asked by someone, you know, is so much better than just a generic email. So I think that's just empowering others to invite people to your event, I think is also pretty important. Yeah. Uh, that's a great point. I mean, we're, you know, you as a chapter leader are marketing, mainly to members or past members, right? But believe it or not, I've got friends that hunt and hunt birds that aren't members, right? Or maybe they were a member five years ago and we're not marketing to them currently. So use your friend groups, share it that way. But we've got templates available. Like there, you know, there's one of these Q and A's talks about the, the time, you know, the time we have, and we totally understand that. We've got templates for all four of these engagement and recruitment events postcards that are ready to go. You just put the event information in, again, plug in your mailing list, hit send. They're automatically sent out of Montana somewhere and they show up in the post office or in your, you know, in your mailbox just in a couple of days. I use that all the time for chapter starts. Your rep can help you with that. So we're really understand the time, like the time it takes to be a volunteer. We, we get that. And we're trying to build tools to make it as easy as possible and your rep's there to help. So yeah, I, I do email. Um, if you can send a postcard, certainly do that. Otherwise, you know, build out a social media template there on ticket printing um, and do that. And now I've just got some information, just some general stuff, time constraints for younger members. They're, they're answering the question on kind of what are, what are the, uh, the restraints to bringing folks in. And, you know, younger people, I, you know, I get your point, Mike, but um, kind of to Andrew's point, you're, you're bringing folks into the chapter 
and they're not saying, yeah, I want to be the president, right? You, a task here, a task there. Do you want to be a part of this? Can you help with this sort of thing? That's, I didn't become a president or a board member of the Lake Country Retrievers Club. I'm just there. And if they ask me to throw a bumper or go to the field and pick something up, I'll do that, you know. Um, but start small with anybody that comes into your chapter. No one wants to be forced into being a president or even uh, encouraged to do so in that very first meeting. So um, I guess one care. other like tool we can bring up too, Will, is, you know, you the reps do a phenomenal job of being like the go-to resource for all these chapters. Um, our E and O team is also yeah. extremely talented. Like, and by, you know, I mean, education and outreach, we have a whole yep. wing dedicated to education and outreach and I'll key it on the word outreach. They're the professionals at creating and hosting these alternative events at scale. And they're more than willing to help you figure it out locally too. They yep. have connections for like NAVDA, all over the country if, if you want to host a dog centric event they're the ones that are helping new chapters try out women on the wing events and women in wild game events like they are a phenomenal resource resource that will bend over backwards to help you explore the concept of trying something new they are a, a great resource um and so it, i know our regional reps can help put you in contact with them as well um, and i cannot speak more highly of, of them 100%. And if you've been listening with me since September, we've heard from Colby, Kerber, Marissa Jensen, and Anna Swarzek. So we've had the E&O team basically yep. here. They've, they've laid out all their programs, but they're just great resources. So your rep can connect you with them as well. Terry, Morris, I've got your question down. Obviously, Chance and I work together as, you know, he's got the Western region here in Minnesota as well. So I'll get you, uh, I'll get that information to him tomorrow morning. And he'll kick you an email on, um, you know, pint nights and how to improve that, that golf tournament. Um, where do we find templates for these events you're talking about? I've got them in the chat. I believe they're in the chapter resource portal. I would think so. If, uh, if not, uh, they can be very shortly. Yes. And I will, I've, I just got them on my computer. I got them somewhere. So I'm thinking it's that. But we've got two individuals that are pretty privy uh, to how the chapter resource portal works here. So if they're not there, I'm writing a note now, we'll put them in there likely in the document center of the chapter resource portal. Um, and Terry just asked, uh, what's an effective technique to gather email addresses? So back to me getting emails about the event I attended and an, an email to the actual banquet. I wasn't on their list until I registered for that hands-on habitat day for, via event group. So if you yeah. host an alternative event, get the word out there and have people actually register. Even if you're not collecting money, you're going to collect their information and then they're on your email list for email solicitation. And chances are even you can also require their mailing address and actually have like the physical address and postcards for the banquets and more traditional things that way. Um, so that's a, another just benefit of utilizing an event group and some of those platforms. If you set it up to like people have to register to attend, well, now you can speak to them in the future too. Yeah, that's an excellent point, my friend. It's 7.58. I think we covered it. I, uh, I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate those of you listening, spending an hour with the two of us. Um, you know, take a risk. Take a meeting off and kind of remember what brought you to the chapter and use that energy to bring somebody new into your chapter. And the more we do that all across the country, the, the stronger this organization is going to be. So if you take anything away from that, uh, from tonight, I hope you take that away. And with that, this concludes the chapter happy hour series. First ever. We'll, well be done, back well, this well summer. Done. Thank you. Thank you. You made it through without any mishaps. I know, I didn't get a bloody night. nose. I've been dealing with it all spring, so we're, we're winning. We're winning. Tonight's a great night. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you Thanks, soon. Thanks,